All right. So I'm assuming, uh, Chelsea, that uh, everyone from the waiting room has gotten in. Um, I can't tell. They're not quite all in yet. Uh, one more. All right. So good morning, everyone. I'm Ken Hare from Condominium Law Group. Valerie is uh, a little bit under the weather today, so she is going to sit out our Q&A this morning. Uh, I don't believe she has COVID, but uh, something else that her small child brought home to her. So um, we'll proceed without her. Uh, some of the kind of housekeeping things we normally do, one is, uh, you know, stay muted unless there's something that uh, you need to unmute yourself to ask a question. And uh, we are recording the session, which everyone should have gotten a notice from Zoom about. The uh, chat can be used to uh, ask questions during this or at the end. We have a relatively short number of actual questions submitted in advance. So there would be time today, it looks like, to discuss additional questions if you have them. Uh, disclaimer, which is this is not legal advice. There are too many specifics about any individual condo or HOA governing documents and too many facts that are specific to a particular circumstance you may be facing for the advice we give to be <clears throat> considered legal advice for your particular circumstance. So if you need legal advice, you need to talk with a qualified attorney who can look at your documents, your facts and circumstances, and make a determination on, on what, uh, what you should actually be doing. Okay. And uh, so as I think Valerie said, you can't use what we say on this as a basically a citation to somebody that uh, they're doing something wrong. Um, a reminder that the nonprofit corporations uh, filing system with the Secretary of State is down for the month of January and February. And a reminder that we still think it's appropriate that uh, boards be considering their COVID protocols in light of the rapidly changing COVID situations. So our recommendation is, you know, put it as a standing item on your board meeting agendas. Uh, for the next month or two, at least until things is sort of, if they ever clean up. Um, one of the things I will announce on behalf of WSCAI, Washington State Community Association Institute, is that there is a webinar tomorrow that they are hosting. And I am one of the two presenters. Uh, the other presenter is uh, Isla Kane, a property manager. And uh, the topic is about governing documents and which governing documents have which kinds of provisions and what to do with conflicting documents. So if you're interested in that topic, uh, contact uh, Michelle Leary at wscai.org and uh, she can arrange for you to attend that webinar. The, uh, I think it's uh, an hour long program so 45 minutes for us to go through uh, presentation and 15 minutes for questions and answers. The entire program is live. It's not done the way that CAI did Law Day or CA Day last year with a pre-recorded presentation. Um, <clears throat> it is the beginning of a new year. And so one of the things that we do recommend our clients do whether it's at the beginning of the year or some other time, is that we do recommend that board members review the governing documents for your association to remind yourself about provisions within them and also to consider any revisions that might be appropriate for your community. So there may be some activities which you are required to do. Most people know they're required to do an audit but there is a surprising number of um, condominium declarations which require annual inspections by licensed architecture engineers regarding the building systems and the building envelope. And a, I would say a majority of the 
condo boards do not read their governing documents and understand that that requirement exists. And so if you have a requirement in your governing documents to have an architect or engineer inspection, we would generally recommend that you do that absent some kind of an informed decision that it's not necessary. And if you don't wanna have an annual inspection because you find the cost to be excessive, then you could look at amending your declaration so that you're not in violation of it when you make a decision not to do that. Okay. Uh, the other things that we think you should be doing, one is updating your collections policy to make sure that it is in compliance with the revisions to the state laws, which took effect in 2021. And those relate mostly to foreclosures, but you should make sure that the policies you're following and what your collections agencies or your attorneys doing collections are following are fully compliant with those new laws. Otherwise, you're likely to run into problems when you do the collections. Uh, the other thing you might wanna do is uh, consider whether or not it's time to update your documents. You know, we work with a lot of clients where their governing documents, whether they're an HOA or a condominium, are 30 to 50 years old. And these documents do not reflect the current statutes, especially those which relate to meetings and notice and voting, which all took effect in July of last year. They do not uh, reflect any of the sort of modern changes which were passed with Ukiowa in 2018. And so the question really becomes one of whether or not it's time for your association to update the documents so that they accurately reflect the statutes which are in control, which may conflict with the documents, and also whether they reflect what is best for your community. So again, just something to consider. And uh, it may be that you need some assistance from an attorney to do that if you decide to do it. Okay. Um, so then we get to the questions which came in. So the first question was, <clears throat> I recently came across a property management company that says it can save on condo associations legal fees by having their attorneys give legal advice company does business in several states. Do you think this is a potential conflict of interest? I'm worried that an out-of-state attorney would be out of the loop regarding Washington state issues. And they also might spread too thin to give a timely accurate answer. So uh, my first uh, response would be that attorneys are required to be licensed in every state in which they practice. So they would have to be licensed in Washington state to give legal advice to a community in Washington state. And so it's not necessary to live in Washington state to be licensed here. Many attorneys are licensed in multiple states. So it's possible that an attorney that is um, part of a management company is licensed in Washington state. But I do think there's a significant potential if not an actual conflict of interest between the attorney working for an association and the same attorney being employed by or working for a management company. One of the things we as a law firm are careful to do is never represent management companies because there is too much of a conflict between the uh, management company and the individual client. And so we do not represent management companies. We frequently give advice to our clients through managers. Managers are agents of the associations and as their agents can be privileged to the information which we share with our clients without that becoming a legal problem later. Uh, but it is, <clears throat> I would say for the most part, unlikely that a, an employee of a management company could not have a conflict of interest between their employer and their employer's client. So there are rules of professional conduct related to this issue. You can certainly look up those. They're uh, under RPC, under the court rules. 
Um, but I think that's the, the answer is that we would recommend against trying to use an in-house lawyer for a management company. Okay. Second question. <clears throat> um, it's entitled Arch, <clears throat> excuse me, Arch Housing. <clears throat> and I don't know what Arch Housing means, but the scenario is man and a wife have two properties, condos in the same building, one in their business name and one in the name of one of the individuals. Is this legal? Where do you report this if it's illegal? Excuse me, Arch is the affordable housing, uh, Ken. So Arch means affordable housing. So, okay, thank you. Um, the answer, the short answer is without seeing more specifics and the declaration for the condominium, there's nothing illegal about one person owning more than one property within a community. And uh, there are frequently business entities like family trusts or LLCs or partnerships which own units. And there's nothing which would prohibit an individual entity or related parties from owning multiple units. Uh, uh, we, under Arch, uh, excuse me, Ken, under Arch, there is a restriction. I just wanted to clarify with you. Uh, if, you are, if you are not uh, familiar with Arch, uh, that means uh, the information is not accurate. Thank you. Okay. And that may be something you need to provide the documents for your community to an attorney to give a specific answer. Um, but we do have a client where something like 40% of the single family homes are owned by an individual or some business entity that they are affiliated with. They've been acquiring properties over an extended period of time. Nothing illegal about that. They get to vote all of those units within the community to elect board members. They have to pay all of those units fees in the uh, assessments every year. So third question is for decades, our HOA paid the treasurer by excusing that board member from dues. Uh, when I arrived, I read the docs and felt that I protested and suggested dividing the $200 four ways as a flat fee reimbursement for those who serve on the board. Okay. Uh, logic is that you can't serve on the board without using cell phones, internets, computer hardware and software, uh, running errands, et cetera, and that these contributions would not be donated in the way time is donated um, as a service on the board. Okay. Uh, is this legal or prohibited by the RCWs? So the, the short answer is that the RCWs do not specifically address whether or not board members can be paid for their service. Most governing documents, I would say a majority of the governing documents have a specific provision that state that board members cannot be paid for their service as a board director, but that they can be reimbursed for expenses. Normally when we say reimbursed for expenses, we would interpret that to mean something very specific like photocopies that you've made for distribution to the owners, <clears throat> we would not usually see that as reimbursement for a part of your cell phone or part of your computer or part of your internet access, which are services that you would have as an individual anyway. There is not a, a prohibition under any of the statutes for board members being compensated. Um, Many associations will have a provision that says that if a board member is providing a service other than to be a director, that they can be compensated for that service. So if a board member is performing the bookkeeping on behalf of the association or a board member is doing uh, the lawn mowing or the board member is managing a re-roofing project then there may be an argument that they can be compensated for providing those services because you would compensate some other person or entity for those services if the board member didn't do it. Uh, our concern is being open and disclosing to all the owners that 
this kind of a credit on dues or payment is being made. And we also are concerned that if you are providing a payment to a board member or volunteer, that you are accurately reporting that in your taxes and to the IRS for purposes of that income. Um, <clears throat> we do suggest that if you're going to compensate board members, that you require that the payment be ratified in the same way that the budget is ratified. I don't know, Chelsea, can you mute whoever's out there that's unmuted? Thank you. So uh, it is a touchy subject because frequently the membership doesn't understand that they are paying or forgiving dues for a board member. Um, but it really depends on whether or not there's some specific services that board member is providing and whether or not you're open and, dis and disclosing that to the rest of your membership. Um, so were there any other questions? Well, here's some chat things. See if I can cover those. Okay. So one question is on the Secretary of State filing, how do we determine what the gross revenue is? For most, it is the assessments collected from the association membership considered gross revenue? Uh, we would generally say that the assessments are not income or gross revenue, but this may be a question for your CPA. If you had cell tower income or you had uh, income from a rental apartment that the association owns, those would count towards gross revenue. Uh, but I actually don't recall seeing a requirement to report income on the Secretary of State's annual report. So maybe that's a new question which is being asked. Um, second question, what is the first steps when new homeowners have openly violated existing bylaws that have not been updated in decades? This relates to Airbnbs and duplexes. How do we reverse these violations? So the the first comment I have on this is that bylaws do not create restrictions on use of property. And uh, the bylaws are a different document than the condo declarations or CCNRs. And we had this come up and I'll talk about it in a little bit that uh, restrictions on use of property are required to be in recorded documents. Most bylaws, bylaws are not recorded and therefore would not be effective in creating a restriction on use. Uh, there could be exceptions. And again, you need to have an attorney look at the specifics for your community to know otherwise. Uh, the second thing is that frequently, if these are older documents, whether it's the bylaws, CCNRs, uh, condo declaration, it will just not address short-term rentals like Airbnbs because they didn't exist at the time the documents were created. And so we have a lot of people who have tried to interpret the single family residential use requirement that is contained within these older documents to prohibit the quote, commercial rental of a, a, a home or a condo on a short term basis. Our challenge with that is that up to this point, the Washington State Supreme Court has treated a short-term residential rental exactly the same as a long-term residential rental. They are both residential use and so would not violate a provision in a set of CCNRs that discusses single family residential use. Now there, there is a split among other states and there's certainly the potential that if you went back to the courts and asked them to review that they could decide that Airbnbs really are not a residential use, but that's not the current state of the law. And you'd have to decide you were willing to spend the money to both go to a trial court and get a ruling and appeal that 
in order to overturn the current uh, opinions of the Washington State Supreme Court. Okay. Uh, in terms of trying to enforce existing uh, restrictions within your governing documents, that becomes also a difficult fact specific question because sometimes a failure to enforce documents over an extended period of time will lead to the abandonment of that particular restriction. So let's say you have a set of CCNRs that prohibits businesses within the homes, but you find out that there are a dozen businesses in your community that have been operating for multiple years and no one has ever bothered to enforce it. Then if you were to try and enforce that now, a court may decide that that particular provision had been abandoned. The court will almost never decide that the entire set of CCNRs have been abandoned, but they may decide that one particular prohibition like the business use had been abandoned. And it will really depend on the uh, pattern of enforcement that you can demonstrate had occurred. It will also depend on the reasonableness. If it's the first time something comes up, like the first time that there's an Airbnb or the first time there's a business then even if it's a decades old provision, it will not be treated as abandoned. It will only be treated as abandoned if it, the provision has been completely disregarded by the association in a knowing fashion, meaning the board knew or the association knew about these businesses and did nothing about it to enforce the declaration. Okay. So <clears throat> if you've got a challenge with new homeowners coming in and violating the declarations, there's a good chance you need to look at the broader picture and have specific facts, and you need to have an attorney help evaluate that for you. Um, next question, which came in both by email yesterday and I believe is now in the chat, is uh, a request to discuss the proper procedure for a condo association obtaining a loan for building repairs. So I'm not going to say there's one proper procedure. So you will need to look at the, the specifics for community. Um, <clears throat> the proposal that the question asker provided was one, determine the scope of work and obtain bids for the cost of building repairs from qualified contractors. I will say that it is necessary to know how much money you need before you start seeking a loan. But frequently the clients will be working with banks well in advance of having the contractors pricing because they're trying to make sure that they have the ability to borrow the money before they actually are ready to sign a contract. So you would simultaneously be working with your construction expert to prepare a scope and get bids at the same time as you're working with banks, usually the architect can give you some uh, rough order of magnitude on what kind of project scope you have, and the bank will work with that up until you have a, a specific price. Okay, So you should have a um, sort of a contingent commitment from a bank to loan money uh, fairly early in the process before you start bidding the contract. Uh, their proposed second step was the board obtains a condo association loan for the total cost of repairs from the bank or lender. So I would say you're not borrowing for the total cost of the repairs because that may not be the amount of money that you need. You are borrowing an amount which is going to allow you to fund your association appropriately. And sometimes that amount is smaller because you have uh, a large number of owners who are paying the special assessment in full, so you don't need to borrow that money. Sometimes you have existing reserves, which will pay a portion of the repair funds. Uh, sometimes you will be borrowing more money so that you can have sufficient reserves to take care of contingencies going forward and making sure that you're adequately funded. So it's, it's a broader issue than just what the cost of the construction project is. And it involves an analysis of the other financial aspects of your community. And a, sometimes it involves 
knowing what additional repairs you have on the horizon with your reserve study. Some banks will require that you have adequate funding to pay for any other major repair that might occur during the time of the loan repayment. So if you are taking out a 10 year loan, they may require that you move forward and accelerate the repairs which would come due in four or six years. So for example, if your roof was gonna require replacement within the next five years, they might require that you do that work at the same time because what they don't want is another special assessment to occur during the time that you are repaying that loan. So their proposed third step is that the association votes to ratify an assessment for the total loan amount. So again, the assessment may not be for the total loan amount. And what you need the membership to approve is actually the assessment that's required to repay the loan. So in conjunction with a loan, you're gonna have proposed a special budget or special assessment, which is going to be either a lump sum which each owner can pay so that they don't participate in the loan, or it's gonna be a stream of payments over some period of years with a fixed amount every month, which those owners are going to pay in order to participate in the association's loan. And yes, you will have to have a budget ratification to make the loan process effective so the special assessment can be collected. So they've got their proposed fourth step as assessing or invoicing the owners for their portion of the repair costs, giving them the option to opt in or to opt out of the loan by either making the stream of payments or by doing the lump sum special assessment. So one of the things which we would tell you is that you should not be providing the option at the end of the process. It needs to be clear when you set up the special assessment, whether it is a lump sum assessment due immediately or whether it is a stream of payments due each month over an extended period of time. Our default recommendation is that you make it a stream of payments over time. And the reason for that is that should an owner default and the bank repossess the property, you have the least risk to the association. If the assessment is a stream of payments over five years and a bank were to foreclose on a unit in year two, the bank would owe all of the assessments that occurred after their foreclosure. And so what that would mean is less risk to the association that the owner defaults, the bank takes the property, the owner declares bankruptcy, and at that point you have no potential recovery anymore. So it is something that you should be talking with uh, the bank about in terms of the size of the loan, because there will be many owners who pay it in full, and they'll pay it in full because it's a lower loan rate for them to finance it personally than to finance it through the association. Mortgages are still gonna be less expensive. Mortgages allow owners to spread the cost over as many as 30 years, and the association can't get as good a rate and cannot spread it over as many years. So if owners are looking to have the smallest financial impact, they will want to finance it individually and make their payment to the association in a single lump sum. So again, these are issues that you should be working with your manager and your attorney and your bank about to try and make sure that you are not creating a larger borrowing authority than you need, that you're not tying your owners into assessment streams that are not the most beneficial to them, uh, but protect the association the best. Okay. Uh, their fifth uh, proposed step was pay the contractor a deposit to be in the repair work for building once the funds are received. So this is actually stepping into a whole other issue of how do you pay contractors for major repairs. Our recommendation to all clients is don't make payments in advance of having work performed. 
All of the contracts that we negotiate for major repairs have a provision that the contractor bills on a monthly basis. They could actually bill more frequently, but monthly is the standard. Those invoices are submitted to the bank. The bank has to also approve them. The bank usually requires your architect or engineer to approve them. And then the bank will advance funds from the loan to pay the contractor. If you have received half the money from your membership in lump sum payments and half the owners are participating in the loan, usually the bank will require that you spend all of the association's uh, money first before the bank will start advancing funds. But sometimes there's a variation in that. Um, but we don't pay contractors in advance. We've had contractors ask for a quarter million dollars up front before they have even stepped onto the job site. And that is just way too risky for an association to do. And we, I'll say we as lawyers are confused why people write big checks in advance to contractors when they don't have anything to show for it. There are times where we will recommend that owners pay for material as they are delivered to the job site. So for example, roofing contractors will often claim that they have to have the money in advance to buy materials. And so what we will do is we will agree that when the materials are delivered to the job site, the contractor should be able to pick up a check. But until they're delivered to the job site, the association doesn't have any way of uh, protecting their interests. They don't have the material, they don't have a lien on the, the material, and there's just too much risk. Um, another question came in on chat. Um, what if not on board, but owner paid to be webmaster? Uh, report to IRS, question mark. So I assume this again re relates to whether or not you're paying an owner or a board member for providing some kind of a service. So there's nothing illegal about paying an owner or a board member to provide any kind of service. Uh, again, we'd want there to be transparency. Uh, we do want to make sure that if a board member or owner is being paid, they are classified as an independent contract that they are not any of the association. There are risks associated with having employees. There are no requirements to the Department of LNI and the Unemployment Security Department. And there are additional um, withholding requirements for employees. If you're in the city of Seattle, there's even more requirements related to paid time off and health benefits. So we recommend that you not have employee relationships with people providing services. And yes, we do recommend that you comply with the IRS's law and report any payment in excess of $600 to the IRS using a 99. Um, next chat comment is the SOS has revised their requiring renewals to be admitted during the month of January using paper, starting marks or renewals can be electronic submitted again. Charge to renew with the SS is $20 for associations with gross revenue under $500,000, $60 for associations with gross revenue that equals or exceeds $500,000. So the question that comes up to my mind is that the uh, Secretary of State has probably done the term gross revenue somewhere and so we would need to research that in order to figure out whether or not they include the assessments which you are receiving on a regular basis or whether they are treating it as income the way that your PA might. And I can't answer that question. Next chat question, are there any new lines or strategies that can prevent any additional Airbnbs be in compliance with Washington Supreme Court? The answer is absolutely there are. 
you amend the CCNRs or you amend your condo declaration to prohibit rentals shorter than a specific period. Uh, and you specifically state that the um, occupancy of a unit by guests or you know, short-term rentals is prohibited. This is one of the most common revisions we are making to, to declaration condominium for clients. We are doing it a case for homeowner associations of single family homes. It's more difficult to evaluate whether or not it's gonna be forcible for single family homes because of a Washington State Supreme Court case uh, called Wilkerson v. Chihuahua, which came out a few years ago. In that case, the Supreme Court held that for a single family home community, specifically that community of Chihuahua, that the association could not prohibit short-term rentals. And that was in part because short-term rentals had been historically allowed in that community for more than 30 years. And so it was a property right, which the association's documents did not allow the community to strip from fellow owners. That is a very specific case viewing this language of that community. So there's certainly the potential that if you amended your documents, there would be a way around that because you're may not be matching what the Chihuahua documents had. To you know, routinely adopt rental restrictions for condominium associations, townhome communities, and it is very common for us to adopt a minimum rental periods of 30 days or six months and to specifically prohibit Airbnb. Uh, the follow-up question here was, is a 90% vote required? If you are governed by the Condominium Act, RCW 6434, then it is likely that a 90% is required, but it will again depend on what's already in your documents. There are many communities which already have a rental period of 30 days written in the document. And so if you got something like that, clarifying that you're not allowed to have an Airbnb is not a new restriction on the use of that condominium, and it would not require a 90% vote. But again, these are very specific factual determinations that have to be evaluated, and I can't give you legal advice for your community over this call. So I had a couple other things that because we've got some time, I was going to, to bring up. And one I mentioned was where you would go to revise your governing documents to accomplish specific ends. So for example, if you're trying to get a rental cap or prevent Airbnbs and you write it into your bylaws, it is not going to be enforceable. And there's gonna be some exceptions to that, and this isn't legal advice, but there is a case, which is Shorewood West v. Sodry, where the state Supreme Court pretty clearly stated that a restriction on use cannot be adopted in the bylaws. It must be adopted in the recorded condominium declaration. And until someone brings another court through the, or another case through the court system and provides different advice, that is our best guide on what is going to be enforceable. So if you want to adopt a provision in your governing documents to shift the insurance deductible to the individual owners or to make individual owners pay for the roofs or the windows, those need to be done in the recorded declaration of CCNRs or the recorded condominium declaration. Because our guidance from the courts is that putting in the bylaws does not count. Now, maybe if the bylaws are recorded, it would count. Maybe if the declaration specifically said that those provisions could be in the bylaws, it could count. That's a level of detail I can't get into in this kind of call. But the, the 
general rule is going to be anything which is affecting the rights and obligations of the property belong in the recorded CCNRs or condo declaration. And it's not going to matter that the custom of the association was a certain way. And it's not going to matter that you may have adopted in the rules in terms of its enforcement in the court system. It may be influential to getting owners to comply with what you want if it's been in the rules for 20 years and if it's been an accepted practice for 20 years. And it's, it's difficult for me to evaluate whether individual owners that you're trying to persuade will follow those resolutions, which may not be enforceable in court. Um, our recommendations as lawyers is make the modifications in a way that will be enforceable if you need to go to court to do so. So the second thing I wanted to offer relates to enforcement of the governing documents. We have a lot of owners who will demand that boards enforce the governing documents for the benefit of that one owner. And maybe it relates to noise, maybe it relates to a business use, maybe it relates to a view which the owner believes their neighbor is now blocking. And one of the things I wanna make sure people remember is that individual owners have all the same powers to enforce using the courts and arbitration if you've got that, independent of the board's authority to do enforcement. So if you've got a, a neighbor who's objecting to the tree in their next door neighbor's yard because it's blocking their view, it is not the association's obligation to enforce that for the neighbor. In fact, we generally discourage boards from trying to deal with disputes between two neighbors. The Condominium Act is fairly specific, as is Ukiowa, that the board can only litigate on behalf of two or more owners. So if you have an issue like a tree that's only benefiting a single owner, the association doesn't have the authority to go to court and enforce that anyway, because it's not on behalf of two or more owners. There are gonna be times where the board will be in the position of having to decide whether or not the issue is a violation of the governing documents. So if we keep using the tree example, I've got a couple clients where the documents will say that an owner cannot have a tree that blocks a view of significance for their neighbor. And so the question is, what is a view of significance? And it may be that the board is gonna to have to step in and decide whether or not the view of significance exists and whether it is being blocked by the, um, the neighbor's tree. There was a, an interesting case, I think out of Everett, which went up into the appellate courts. And I think it's Picnic Point is the name of the community where a, a tree blocked part of the view and an, a owner who was like three or four blocks away was complaining about the tree and up to that case, we would have said that the amount of view that the tree blocked was insignificant and did not justify any enforcement. And instead the court ruled that there was no such thing as a minimum amount of view being blocked. And that uh, it was true that it was a small, very small amount of view that was blocked, but it was blocking part of the view across the horizon from that one owner's home. And the, uh, the court ruled that that was a violation of the CCNRs. And so there is a difference between an owner pursuing that legal claim and the association viewing that legal claim. And this particular case sort of threw a wrench in what I thought had been pretty well established law about there having to be a significant impact um, before the violation could be found. So it, it's again sort of gets to the issue of 
the particular facts and the particular language for your community being incredibly relevant to whether or not a violation exists, whether or not you can enforce, whether or not it's reasonable to enforce. Okay. Um, the last thing I would offer, unless any other questions come in in the chat, is that um, I'd like to make sure that boards remember that there is the option frequently of doing nothing when issues come up, but that I want to make sure that when you do nothing, you're doing it with uh, an informed uh, set of information or you know an informed board after deliberation rather than doing nothing because you failed to consider an issue or failed to take action when you should. Okay. Um, I frequently will tell the attorneys in my office that doing nothing is one of the options. You know, when we're looking at what can a board do about the Airbnb or about the tree, one of the options is the board does nothing. But I want that action to be a concerted action by the board after the board has met its duty to inquire and get objective information. And then I want them to sort of state on the record that they're going to do nothing. Okay. So I, if it is something like this tree dispute and uh, the neighbor sues the other neighbor over the tree and they also sue the board because the board didn't make the tree come down. I want to be able to look back at the board meeting minutes and see that the individual owner had requested the board take action, that the board had examined the tree and had considered the view that was being blocked, and the board had made a decision and reflected it in the meeting minutes that they were not going to take action about the tree. Because that would tell me that the board had fulfilled its duty of care for adequate inquiry and objective information. And it would mean that uh, the association would likely be able to survive that lawsuit without anything being found wrong because they, they did what they were supposed to do. So the failure to take the tree down is not where the board would have a likely liability. The failure to consider the issue and respond to the owner when they made the request creates a procedural flaw which they may have liability for. So that's where I'm, I'm trying to make sure that uh, you, you don't feel an obligation every time an owner comes and demands you enforce the rules as the owner perceives them. There is not an obligation to do all that. There is an obligation to at least consider the complaint and make a decision about whether or not you should enforce it or not. So it looks like one other question just came in on the chat. Quick question, are CCNRs and rules and regulations state that owners are responsible for the expensive repair of their balconies? We had a comment that limited common elements and, or that limited common elements are HOA responsibility is that a legit, legitimate concern? So I would have to see the documents to be able to analyze this. If you have rules that state owners are responsible for balconies and your CCNRs state that the association is responsible for balconies, then the priority of documents would have the declaration control and it would be the association's responsibility. Uh, but it also really depends what we're talking about, both in terms of the definition of a balcony and the definition of maintaining it. Because you can have the owners obligated to keep it clean and tidy, even if the association is responsible for repairing the structure. And then what the boundary is, is a, a common issue that uh, we're challenged with in these questions. Most people think of the balcony as the structure. But in most condominiums, the structure is really part of the common elements, the same as the floor between two units is a common element. And the balcony limited common area is 
more akin to a parking space limited common area. It is a block of air within which only one owner can park their car. And the decks and patios are a block of air which only one owner has the right to use. Typically the boundary of that limited common element is defined as the inside surfaces of the building, floor, ceiling, handrail that surrounds the limited common element deck. And so to answer this question really requires an examination of your particular decoration, an examination of what the boundaries are of the balconies as defined by your declaration or as defined by the statute involved. And uh, if there's a conflict between your rules and your CCNRs, uh, our recommendation would be to follow the CCNRs or amend the CCNRs to match the rules if that's what you're looking for. All right, well, I think that brings us to a conclusion today. Uh, I want to thank everybody for attending and uh, hopefully Valerie will be back next week when we do this again. Thanks, everyone.